the greater the possibility Russia will impose its own solution, perhaps all the way to the Polish border. Realistic? Is it realistic to wait for new U.S. elections? Well, I don't think it's realistic to wait, period. That's why every day I say we should negotiate. I find it, I really find it shocking that since February 24th, 2022, uh, as far as I know, there hasn't been one phone call between uh, Biden and Putin. What kind of world is this? If, if they want a link, I can send them a Zoom link. They can talk to each other. I mean, what, what is the point of not talking? You might not agree. Uh, you might really violently disagree, but that's a verbal disagreement. I mean, the violence is on the, on the battlefield. Talk to each other, for God's sake. You know, that's what is shockingly missing. And uh, there's so much to say about this, but, you know, one of my favorite lines of JFK was from his inaugural address uh, where he said, uh, let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. And come on, pick up the phone, Joe. <clears throat> Call Vladimir, talk. Because, you know, President Putin has some real points that you need to discuss, and you can make your points and find a way out of this. So don't wait. And also, you know, I, I'm, I'm an economist. I'm not a, a, a military guy. I'm, I'm quoting you, uh, Alexander. So, uh, uh, but I know in economics, what is often said is, well, we have to wait or things need to get worse before they get better. This is the stupidest advice. I've been involved in problem solving for 40 years. You don't wait for things to get worse so they can get better. Generally, when things get worse, they get worse after that. Things spiral out of control. Panics happen. Unexpected consequences. By the way, most unexpected consequences are, uh, could, could be expected uh, if you think about them hard enough. But most people don't, so they become unexpected consequences. We should not wait. Today, President Biden should pick up the phone and call his counterpart, and they should say, look, this is a terrible situation. We have terrible disagreements, but we're going to talk to see if we can find a way out of this. Because once they start hearing from each other, there actually are valid points to be exchanged between the two sides. And so that's why I said when President Putin put his draft agreement on the table on December 17, I immediately called the White House, said there's a lot of good in there and a lot that's negotiable. And by the way, the main point I made was not expanding NATO is not a concession. It's just prudence. It's not giving up something. It's just common sense, for God's sake. So it's not a concession. And don't wait till the next election. Definitely don't wait. Let's get the negotiations going now. Absolutely. We'll do uh, two more questions. Uh, Elza asks how to negotiate. March 2023, you won't give depleted uranium to Ukraine. June 2023, U.S. wants to give depleted uranium to Ukraine. So how do you negotiate? It, yeah, it's even more shocking than that because there, there was a Washington Post story a week or two ago, and the headline was something to the effect that Biden increasingly uh, um, ignores every Russian red line. And then the, the whole story was these idiots, sorry to say, in Washington saying, well, uh, Putin's bluffing. So now we know we can go farther. We can go farther. We can go farther to oops. OK, there goes the world. You know, what are we doing? What are we doing? Of course, we're violating every statement that we've made. Things escalate in wars. And we have a war machine in the United States. And then we have, you know, Stoltenberg and, I mean, and all the spin masters and everyone else saying, oh, if we, you know, compromise, we'll lose face with China as if this is about China and if, you know, this is really going to determine something about China. It's mindless. But when you ask the question, how can you negotiate? President Kennedy said in the peace speech, both sides have incentives to agree to terms 
that are beneficial for each and to stick with those terms. So you make agreements that make sense. That's how to do it, not imposed agreements, but agreements that make sense. And I think that there is plenty of space for such agreements. That's the point. I have thought all along over the last 30 years, the last thing in the world we need is a confrontation between the United States and Russia. And again, I was Yeltsin's economic advisor in 1992. Yeltsin was saying, we want to be friends. We want to be normal. We want to be fully economically integrated. The United States could not hear yes for an answer. This goes back 30 years. You know, Yeltsin, I know it. He said it to my ear. I, you know, we want to just be normal country. We want to have good relations. The United States, it goes in one ear and the United States says, oh, oh, I see. You want a unipolar U.S.-led hegemonic world. That We get it. You know, this is how it gets processed in the American uh, mental machinery of the military industrial complex. So there are grounds for negotiating that are mutually beneficial. Russia actually would benefit from peace. The United States would benefit from peace. Europe would benefit from peace. The rest of the world would benefit from peace. Ukraine would be saved. That's why it's good that we negotiate because there's a space for mutual gain for all parties. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, controlled demolition says the Cuban Missile Crisis happened because we had to put missiles in Turkey and resolve it. And to resolve it, those missiles were removed. The, the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, happened because uh, things were spinning out of control in the late 50s and early 60s uh, over Cuba, over the failure to have a actually a treaty that ended World War II over the remilitarization of Germany, over a harebrained scheme at the time, by the way, which is little understood, but uh, the, the best historians understand this very well. The Eisenhower administration was toying with giving nuclear weapons to Germany. And we have that today. We have Zelensky sometimes saying maybe we should have nukes and uh, others saying the same thing. Well, this is a, a sure way to end the world if we start uh, with that. Uh, but in the late 1950s, this was actually on the table. And uh, when the United States started to pull back from giving nukes to uh, Germany, thinking maybe it's not such a great idea, actually, de Gaulle came forward to Adenauer and said, we'll make a good agreement with you guys. And we could discuss that issue as well. So there were a lot of games being played in the early 1960s. It was an extremely, extremely dangerous period. At the root of it was, I believe, that the United States and the Soviet Union never talked about the fundamental security interests at the end of World War II. And there was never a peace agreement about Germany. There was just a decision starting in 1948 there will be a Federal Republic of Germany, a West German state, and NATO. Uh, it will be established 1949. Germany will become the bulwark of NATO. We will remilitarize uh, on our side. And by the way, this idea is so commonplace, oh, almost no one in the United States would say, well, that's not why the Cold War happened. Uh, the Cold War happened because of Stalin and this and that. But actually, if you really study this, if you listen to Kennan, uh, if, you, uh, if, if you read uh, Mark Trachtenberg, uh, brilliant history uh, of the Cold War, you can see Russia, I'll say Soviet Union, had deep security concerns completely understandable after losing more than 20 million people. And the United States was completely unwilling to discuss them. And that is a core structural feature of the world since 1945 until today in Ukraine. The United States, for lots of reasons, mainly arrogance, is unwilling to accept that any other country has security concerns. 
The United States has a big security concern. It wants to be number one in the world. But then if any other country says, well, we have security concerns, the United States says, no, you don't. How could you? We're peace loving. We run the world. How could you have security concerns? And that has been a problem actually since 1945. And that is also where we are today. And I think, I think perhaps so one, one more, did you say? One more, because at least that's a great uh, segue to our final question, which is on the screen right now, which is how do you see the U.S. Uh, future given everything that's happening right now? I, <laughs> that's a good question. It's a big question. You know, <laughs> no, but, but question. you know, it, 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 it's basically this. I'm 68. The U.S. has been at war almost every year of my life. My political consciousness, I, my first uh, political awareness actually was the Cuban Missile Crisis. It may sound odd. I was seven years old at the time, but I remember looking at airplanes flying above my primary school uh, and telling a friend, maybe they're coming to drop bombs on us. That was my understanding in October 1962. Uh, I remember uh, the, the height of the Cold War. Uh, I marched against Vietnam. Uh, we learned about Cambodia, about Laos, places that I've spent my career visiting and working in and not being able to walk in the fields because of American landmines that are still completely strewn uh, across Cambodia and the United States doing goddamn nothing to help them get rid of these landmines that uh, came from this completely reckless and illegal bombing more than half a century ago. And then the wars in Latin America, which I know a lot about. Uh, a, a president said to me, they're going to take me out, Jeff. And I said, no, 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 no. And he was overthrown in a coup, U.S. coup afterwards. I've seen this with my own eyes for decades. It's very despairing very despairing. And of course, I've tried to say for decades, there's a better way. This doesn't help the U.S. at all. It really doesn't. We have so many problems. We rank somewhere between 40th and 50th in the world in life expectancy right now. Can you imagine? We've had years of decline of life expectancy. This is a society that's falling apart in many ways. On my street in New York, there are shootings on both ends of the street right now. It's unbelievable what's happening. And we want more war. We want bigger military budgets and so on. Now, when I say we, the basic problem is the American political system got hacked and ruined systematically 40 years ago. Yeah, not everything was great beforehand, but the spigots of big money were turned on by design. Actually, it's a fascinating story uh, that uh, the, the corporate sector was worried about the New Deal and all the uh, environmental uh, regulations and, and uh, worker safety regulations and so forth. And a corporate lawyer, Lewis Powell, wrote a memo about how the companies needed to retake American politics. And Richard Nixon put him on the Supreme Court. And his opinion was, OK, all corporate political giving is free speech. They, they, they completely broke a political system of one person, one vote to make it one dollar, one vote. And we parceled out the American political system to big lobbies. In health, we have our big health care. So everything's twice as expensive as it should be uh, in uh, in finance, we have Wall Street, which dominates. Uh, we get 2008 financial crisis and so forth. Foreign policy got parceled out to the military industrial complex. This isn't a U.S. foreign policy. It's a very narrow foreign policy of a, of a piece of the government that responds to very particular interests. And we did the same in, in many other sectors, big oil and the, the same thing. So the American political system is broken. That's our problem. We can't solve problems right now. Uh, it's too much money. It's not Democrats and Republicans, by the way. That's theater. That's the theatrics. 
Uh, both parties take money from the billionaires. George Soros just said that, uh, you know, he's given his empire to his son. His son said, well, I'm going to make massive contributions to the Democratic Party. Well, they're billionaires in the Republican Party. It's This is the game right now. And this is why it's really <laughs> amazing. Now, where does optimism come in? Most of the world says, do your thing. But actually, we'd like economic development, climate safety, uh, health care, other things. So most of the world is really saying right now, look, United States, fine. Don't, as I said, don't bomb us. Uh, don't expect us to do your sanctions regime. But come on, don't break the whole world. And let's actually solve some problems in the world. And I'm very enthusiastic about progress that's being made in many places in the world. I love this agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, by the way, because I've been going for years and I've been saying in the region, you guys have the same problems, get together to solve them. One time I was visiting Tehran and I was taken around Tehran and showed all this surface water that was evaporating because of climate change and the dust storms. And we had a cocktail party on a, in a, in a uh, apartment building and it was all black. It was just dust storms. And then I went to Riyadh right after that and heard the same thing. And I said, why don't you have a joint center with uh, you know, with the, tur oh, no, no, that's impossible, impossible, uh, you know, but of course, it's the most sensible thing in the world that neighbors that share a problem should should work together. So the Middle East is coming together. The African Union actually really, truly is forming an Africa wide consensus about economic development, about basic infrastructure. This is extremely important. ASEAN is doing the same thing. China and its Belt and Road Initiative is an extremely constructive idea for integrating different parts of the world in modern infrastructure. There's a lot to be positive about. There really is. I don't expect the U.S. Uh, actually to be the first to make the breakthroughs. I expect most of the world to move forward and say to the U.S., we hope you solve your problems. We really do. Just don't make problems for us. And I think that that is the most likely route to success right now. Of course, I'd like the U.S. to do better than that, but I'm not holding my breath. You know, at the U.N., one of my jobs is to help or not jobs because it's volunteer. But one of my activities is to advocate for the sustainable development goals, the 17 globally agreed goals. And I'll just close with this observation, which is really telling. We have 193 governments in the United Nations. All governments are supposed to present their sustainable development goal plans. And it's called voluntary national review because each government tells the other governments what they're doing. So VNRs. And they do that each summer. So 188 countries have presented VNRs out of 193 to my mind, that shows a lot of world interest in sustainable development. Five countries have not done so. What are they? South Sudan, Myanmar, uh, uh, Haiti, uh, South Sudan, Myanmar, Haiti. Uh, I'm missing two and missing one because the fifth one is the United States of America. Uh, so the U.S. hasn't even woken up to the fact that there's a global agenda right now, actually one that the United States absolutely needs. And so to my mind, I wouldn't expect the solutions to come out of Washington. I'm hoping that American politics can be repaired. I'm hoping that America stops having wars all over the world. I'm hoping that the 800 overseas military bases are closed down in vast numbers and people come home uh, and that we attend to our domestic problems. Uh, and I'm hoping that the world consensus that climate change and 
uh, and uh, the collapse of our oceans and the destruction of our beloved rainforests and so forth are really serious problems, that poverty is a serious problem, that artificial intelligence and digital is both an opportunity and a threat that needs to be faced, that we focus on the real things, not on escalating to nuclear destruction. And I'm optimistic that most of the world sees this. I'm very disappointed, of course, in Europe, because I have long believed that Europe is a lot smarter and sounder than the U.S., but it has at least Brussels, maybe the problem is it was a bad idea to put NATO headquarters and European Union headquarters in the same city. This may be the fundamental problem because it's a fundamental confusion. And I have to say, Alexander, I'm sorry to end on a, I used to love Britain, <laughs> but, but I have to say Britain taught the United States so many bad habits. Oh. I say it often. It's true. And uh, I'm, anyway, us English speakers, we, we need to rethink the act. <laughs> that, that, I think, is the, uh, the, the bottom line of all of this. Uh, we got a lot of healing to do at home, and I hope that the rest of the world takes the lead uh, in solving the really big global problems.